Tēnā tātou katoa. Welcome. Uh, lovely to see you all here today. My name is Una Hopkins and I'm the DCE for District Leadership and Democracy. And one of my roles in council is actually to oversee the election process. So um, it's my one of my duties today um, is to take uh, potential candidates or people who are looking to think about standing for council through what I call the, the rules of engagement and help you through that process. So before getting to today, you may have been asking yourself the question around what's your why? Today's conversation is not going to uh, dwell on that or help you come to your why. That's a conversation that you'll have with your friends and your family and your whanau, and you will come to that decision. What we do from here on in is to help guide you through, once you've understood your why and you've made a decision to stand for council, what might be the process that you need to go through and as I said before, the rules of engagement, what that looks like. So there is an electoral team um, that oversees the council elections and for that we have a contract for service with elections.com. That is led by Warwick Lamp who is our electoral officer and his role is to make sure that the process is completely within the realms of all of the legal requirements. He'll be involved in all of the counting and he'll provide us with that final result on the day. He is supported by an in-house team uh, led by our Deputy Electoral Officer Rick Dunn um, and he is supported by quite a large number of people within council who take on duties um, of being electoral officers during this time. And that's to help people fill in their nomination forms, um, deal with complaints that we might get and any other issues that might come up in the election period. So, what are some of the roles and responsibilities of the electoral officer? It's really around the conduct of the whole election. And the electoral officer is not subject to any direction from us as a local authority. That's the great thing about having a contract for service. They're a completely independent body that run the election process for us. They also provide a level playing field for all of our candidates. So we might need to first look at what does local government and what is it all about. And local government has changed over the last couple of years to the point where we are beyond just looking at roads and footpaths and potholes. We're actually about enabling the democratic local decision making, but we're also here to promote social, economic, environmental, and the cultural well-being of the communities in which we live. And so some of the things that the council will actually be involved in is around setting that strategic direction for Rotorua, and that's done through a long-term plan. The council will also set and determine the services and the activities that our people in, council, in Rotorua will receive. It's also about keeping our people in our district safe by having some policies and bylaws. And that's, for example, around uh, where might our dogs be able to roam? Do we want them in the inner city or do we want them outside um, that urban fence and that? Where is it safe to drink alcohol or not? And so these are the kinds of things that come under policy uh, formulation. One of council's big roles is advocating for Rotorua on the behalf of Rotorua people. And that is done by working with central government, other government agencies and stakeholders. Um, and we're working on behalf of the community for issues that are affecting Rotorua people. There's a lot of work wrapped up in a district plan, and the district plan looks to how we look after the environment in which we live in, and where the district may develop as we mature and grow into the future. And lastly, one of the major functions of council is to encourage locals to be a part of the decision-making process, encouraging people to have their say and be a part of uh, formulating and guiding what will happen for Rotorua's future. There's no real 
definition of what an elected member is. And there actually isn't any real job description either. But there are some fundamentals for what a uh, elected member should be able to do. An elected member should be able to lead our community. They should be able to represent our community and advocate on behalf of our people. And they should be able to be good influencers when they are dealing with other agencies and stakeholders. And again, this is looking at being able to do all of these things for the betterment of the whole district. That's what it means to be an elected member and that's what good governance is all about. Even though there isn't a true defined uh, job description, there are some core competencies that make being an elected member a little bit easier. Having a genuine interest um, in the issues that are facing our community and being able to be relatable to people. So strong people skills goes a really long way in being able to fulfill your role as an elected member. Having really good listening and public speaking skills and being able to express yourself and your ideas clearly and being results focused. Council is a complex business, so elected members need to be able to understand, analyse and resolve those complex issues. And one of the key things which is really important for elected members is understanding and knowing the difference between governance and management. And the easiest way, I guess, to sum that up is that the council have only one employee, and that is the chief executive. So council, as we talked about before, sets that strategic direction and guides policy and bylaws they instruct the chief executive to deliver that. And so through all of the chief executive staff, the staff then are able to deliver the operations and deliver upon the vision that the council has set. A really good elected member will also sign up to a code of conduct. So a code of conduct is required by law. Um, and what councillors will do is they will sit down and work out what behaviours that they want to set themselves up to live by. And that should drive them through their, that first three years of getting in and working together as a council. Elected members need to be able to undertake research, read reports and agendas. And there is a lot of reading involved in being an elected member. You also need to be engaged and present, and that, I guess, comes back to the research, the reading, and lots of paperwork. Because if you don't come prepared, um, how can you actually be there and advocate um, on behalf of your uh, constituents that you're representing? Elected members also need to be flexible. It's not a nine to five job. There will be evening work and there will be um, weekend work available as well. So what does remuneration look like in terms of being an elected member? The mayor is a full-time job, okay? There is a base salary for councillors and for our community board members, and those base salaries are worked upon a, a formula that is given to us by the local remuneration authority, and most of it is actually driven by the size of our district. So if you go to other TLAs, they'll have a different base salary. Elected members are paid fortnightly, but there is also the opportunity for additional remuneration, and that depends on levels of additional responsibility. So a chair or a lead of a portfolio may um, be remunerated accordingly for that, and that is worked on between the mayor and the councillors after the elections. There's a pretty tight time frame um, around the elections. Um, some of us probably don't feel like that's quite a long lead in time to the elections, but there's some really key dates for the community and for candidates. So the election period started on the 8th of July, so that's three months out from election day. And the nominations then opened a week after that on the 15th of July. 
From the 6th of August, and we'll touch on this one a little bit later on, there'll be a whole lot of election signs that start going up around our district. Come the 12th of August, all nominations will be in. So we'll be able to publish and let the community know who is running for council this time round. The voting papers themselves start getting posted out to the community from about the 16th of September, and then it's all on. By the 8th of October, everybody needs to have returned their voting forms. And unfortunately, we, are still, we still have a very old system for returning your voting papers, and that is by post, or coming into council and handing them in, or this time round, we'll have some additional um, voting or polling boxes, whatever you want to call them, at various key locations within the district. So the key thing there is for people who are returning their voting papers by post, don't leave it too late because it has to be received by 12 noon on the 8th of October. Hopefully come around about the 13th of October, the official declaration will be made. And then the day after that is posted, uh, elected members um, take up their position of being an elected member. They can't operate and do any acting as an elected member though until after the inaugural council meeting. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So, what does the voting system look like this time round? It's a little bit different. So what are the candidate positions that are available that you might be looking to stand for? There is, of course, the position of mayor, and everybody in our district votes for who they wish to have as the mayor. We then, this time round, have three wards, and within those three wards, there's a total of 10 councillors. We have a general ward which will have six seats in that. We'll have a Maori ward which has three seats in that and a rural ward that has one seat in that, making up those 10 members. The key to knowing where to vote this elections is understanding which electoral roll that you are currently on, whether you're on the Maori electoral roll or the general electoral roll, and that will determine um, who you're voting for. It will also be a large consideration for you as a potential candidate where you wish to stand and who your nominees may be, or nominators, sorry. Uh, we also uh, are a part of two regional councils, uh, part of Rotorua, only a small part of that falls in the Waikato region. Um, most of us uh, fall within the Bay of Plenty and they are also seeking nominations for uh, members in their areas. Just a couple of maps up there just to illustrate uh, the ward boundaries that just highlights the, the Maori ward which covers the entire district um, and the map there that shows the distinction between our um, general ward and our rural ward areas. So the nomination process. So that's a four week process which opened up on the 15th of July and closes on the 12th of August. And there are a number of things that you need to submit when you're putting your nomination in. And you have to put all of that information together when you submit your nomination. That will include your nomination paper, your profile statement, your personal photo, and a $200 deposit. You can pay that by cash. If you pay it online, we'll need to see some evidence that that has been deposited into the RLC bank account there will be no checks accepted. We also need to see evidence of your New Zealand citizenship, and that can be your passport or a birth certificate. You don't have to come in to the council building to lodge your nomination. You can scan all those documents and send them through to our deputy electoral officer. They will get all checked and verified, um, and then you will, uh, you will be informed that your nomination um, has met all of the requirements and you're officially standing um, in one of the wards and now a candidate. So 
when you're putting your nomination forward, you do have to state whether you are standing in um, multiple wards or multiple positions. Okay, You have to declare that on your forms. And you must state if you reside in an area um, of the election or not. So that is things like, and, and this will appear on the candidate uh, booklet, around your principal place of residence being within or not within Rotorua. If candidates are looking to stand for Waikato or Bay of Plenty, you need to go to their offices to put your nomination forms in. And a voting paper will look something like this. Um, names on our voting papers appear in random. So if you're sitting down with your friends and family, don't fill the paper in once. Every paper will be different, okay? So be very careful to read your voting papers to make sure your tick goes against the candidate that you uh, wish to see representing you at council. Just a couple of examples here of what the nomination forms um, can look like um, and the uh, returns form. So we, we do collect a lot of information. Um, if you need help with any of that, our electoral um, office team will be able to help you fill, fill those in in terms of making sure you put the right information in the right places. Do you need some qualifications to be an elected member? The long and the short of that answer is actually no. So long as you are a New Zealand citizen and you are enrolled on the electoral roll and your nominator and your seconder are also on the roll in the ward that you are standing, you can stand for council. However, if you're in jail and your sentence is three or more years, um, you can't run. Okay, and you can't stand in this election for more than one ward. So you can run and put yourself forward for mayor and then one of the wards, but you can't run in the Maori ward, the general ward and the rural ward. You have to choose one. You cannot stand for the Bay of Plenty Regional Council and the Rotorua Lakes Council also. Um, and you can't have an interest with council where you, you may have a contract with the Council for Service, that is over $25,000 a year. I've already touched on the fact that um, you can stand for a Mayor's position and a Councillor position, and, if you, and you can stand for the Maori ward if you are non-Maori or on the general role, but that's where it comes down to having your nominators being on that particular role. Can you withdraw your nomination if you decide that you then don't want to stand? And the answer to that is no. You cannot withdraw for strategic or political uh, reasons after the nominations have closed. The only grounds for withdrawal is having died or being incapacitated, and a medical certificate would be required for that. If for any reason those things above happen, um, the application for withdrawal can be made um, by the candidate or on the agent on their behalf. So looking at providing a profile. So you don't have to provide a profile, it's not mandatory, but this is an opportunity for you to be able to present and get across to your constituents what policies that you um, are leading out on. It can only be 150 words, so it needs to be pretty succinct. And our electoral officer, he does count the words. So anything over 150 words, if it's one or two out, he may make some changes of take an and out here and take a something out there. Um, but, and he would do that on your behalf. If it's considerably over 150, he will be making contact with you to get you to revise that down to the 150 words. Your profile needs to be provided to us in an MS Word document. We can't receive it in a PDF and we definitely can't receive it in handwritten format. We need to make sure that for your safety, um, we get the words that you've written as your profile um, exact into the letter. 
In your um, profile, you cannot comment on the policies of any other candidate. Um, and the profiles will be on the website as soon as they are ready after the nominations close. Candidate contact details will also be on the council website um, after the close of nominations. Photos. We do need a photo. So a photo goes in the candidate handbook and goes alongside your profile. Photos need to be in colour and they need to be of yourself within the last 12 months. And we're looking for that lovely passport photo. We only want head and shoulders and the photo has to be just of yourself. So no friends, family, pet or anything like that can be in the photo with you. No hats and sunglasses. We want to see your full face. The photos can be provided, need to be provided as JPEGs and scanned to 300 DPI so that they get them nice and sharp in the candidate handbook. Here's an example of what the candidate handbook would look like. Um, just picking up on some of those elements that we've just talked about in terms of where you reside um, and uh, wards or positions that you are standing for your photo and the beginning of your profile. Moving into campaigning. So your nomination's in and you're gonna start your campaign. Well, actually campaigning has already started. So you will have already seen, I think, a lot of collateral out there. They might not have their nominations in yet. So campaigning can start any time. When you are campaigning, you can't use any council resources. So you can't use the council logo or our branding or run your campaign that's even close to our council colours. You can't put anything on our council Facebook page or our Instagram or Twitter feeds or photos or council buildings. You can't campaign or electioneer in our council chambers or in any of our council premises and you can't collect your electors' voting papers. You need to leave that up to electoral officers and for voters to return their own voting papers. Campaigning material, that includes signs and posters and billboards, flyers, ads, you name it, they must have an authorisation. So the authorisation is uh, your name and some contact details. The contact details um, rules have lessened a little bit, um, so that uh, contact detail can be an address. Not everybody's comfortable with that, so you now can provide a mobile number, an email number or a post office box. But the authorisation must be on the front page of any type of campaigning material that you put it out. You can't hide it anywhere on the back of a billboard or the back of a pamphlet or anything like that. And the content on your signs is subject to the Advertising Standards Authority guidelines um, and they must be factual. And it goes without saying that the rules uh, around defamation apply for information that you're putting up on signs. Social media. <laughs> Beware of social media. <laughs> when we look at council social media, in this period of time, there can be no posting onto council's pages or accounts. There can't be any campaigning comments or replies on our council pages. You can't mention or tag council in your campaign. You can't picture tag, you can't rate or review, and there's definitely no electioneering by anyone on any council channel. It is also illegal for you to take a picture of your completed voting paper and post that on Facebook on your Facebook post. And if you are using paid Facebook posting um, advertising, you will have to register as a politician. Otherwise, you will find you will not be able to post anything like that onto Facebook. They've got some pretty strict rules about all of that. 
Council do have a responsibility to promote the election. We stay neutral with candidates and you won't see anything on our social media channel about candidates, but you will see a strong campaign to encourage people to stand for council. And more importantly, later on, once those nominations have closed, for people to vote, okay? Our current council still have a job to do until the 8th of October when the, when the election happens. So business as usual will still be reported. So you may still see photos of our mayor and our current councillors undertaking their day-to-day -day work and that is what they are required to do. That is business as usual for them. What you won't see any um, current elected members doing is opening a facility and cutting a card and uh, cutting the rope and then saying this building has been opened because I have been involved. That would be them electioneering and that's a no-no. Election signs or hoardings. So from the 6th of August through to the 9th of October, you can start putting up signs around the district and you'll see lots of these. Signs are governed by our council hoardings policy and that provides um, information on sign size and placement for those. You can put your signs up on private land you are only allowed to put up one sign per candidate per site. If you are trying to put something up on a state highway, please get hold of NZTA. Um, they have some pretty strict rules around signage on local highways. You can sign right your vehicle, and that is totally appropriate. And you may have already seen the use of back of the bus advertising for some candidates, and that is totally appropriate also. The back of the bus advertising isn't covered by our hoardings policy. Now, this is a funny one. Your sign itself is an election expense, and you will have to disclose that, but you don't have to disclose the cost of the framing. So the wood that's going to hold up your sign is not an election expense. If you or anybody in the community has a complaint about signs, they need to come through to council's enforcement officer, um, not our EO or our DEO, although they will hear about it also. Um, and there's a process that we go through to ensure then, if we get a complaint, um, that uh, those signs are adhering to the rules. If you've got any other complaints in particular around the authorisation, those need to go th directly through to the electoral officer. Donations. So if you're a candidate, you can accept donations, but you have to record every donation that you receive. You don't have to accept a donation. So if somebody wants to fund your campaign, you don't have to accept that. And you should be very careful for why you accept a donation. Any donation has to be disclosed on the candidate expenditure return. Anonymous donations. This has been quite an interesting one for us in the office to have conversations about. There isn't actually such a thing as an anonymous donation if you know who it has come from. So I can't rock up to candidate B and say, I want to give you a donation, but I want you to record it as anonymous. Well, that's not anonymous by any stretch, okay? Anonymous means you don't know who it has come from and you can't reasonably work it out. And this day and age of electronic banking and all the likes, um, it would probably be quite hard um, to say that you can't reasonably work out where a donation has come from. Okay. A third party who passes on a donation to you must also di disclose uh, who that donor is. If it is a true and legitimate anonymous donation, it can't be any more than $1,500. 
Okay, if it is over $1,500, the balance has to be given to the electoral officer and he will then pass it on to council. And it's also an offence to try and split up an anonymous donation to keep it under that $1,500 um, limit. There is an amount that every candidate is allowed to invest into their campaign. For the mayoralty, this is $40,000, and various um, monetary limits there, depending on the ward that you are in. And the different limits there uh, are based on the fact that there's different population sizes um, in those wards. Now, if you are running for mayor and say a council position, you take the highest limit, so you can't double up. So if you're running for the mayor and then you're running in the Maori ward, you don't have $60,000 towards your campaign, you have $40,000 that you can um, spend on your campaign. The limits for your election campaign apply to the same period as the election period, so that started on the 8th of July um, and commences on the 8th of October. I've already talked about the limits, so no doubling up. The higher the, higher the position, that is your limit for your expenses. And if uh, your campaigning has started before that 8th of July period, there's a little bit of work that needs to do on pro rata uh, those expenses and, and uh, there can be assistance to help you work that out. You do need to return um, an election expense form and those are generally due uh, by about the 8th of December. And based upon that and checking off that you have um, spent the right funds on your campaign, um, the deposit will be returned. So the deposit itself will not be refunded until the return is completed. Okay. Your electoral expenses and your donations are a public document. That means that what they will be on council's website and people will be able to see those for a maximum of seven years. It stays around for a long time. There are a number of potential election offences and you should be aware of these. So imitating your voting paper bribing people or treating people to vote for you are all classed as election offences. So you can't invite uh, voters along to a dinner and then say that you're going to pay for the dinner if they vote for you. You can't go out to the pub and shout a round of drinks and then state, I'm only shouting if you're going to vote for me. You also can't give away pens, notepads, fridge magnets, or any item of value because that may be seen as a bribe or is definitely seen as being a treat. Other election offences include undue influence. So you cannot stand over someone and make sure they vote for you. Put your tick next to me. Um, and you can't um, have unauthorised advertisements. I think we've, we've talked about that quite a few times now. Um, an illegal nomination, um, that is being a candidate with a court order, um, and we would generally pick that up at nomination time anyway. If at any point in time there is a formal complaint that comes in, the electoral officer will pass that straight on to the police, okay, because that is an offence. Here's some examples of signs. Uh, voting for Fred Dagg for the town ward is a totally legitimate sign. However, if your sign then is trying to use persuasion to vote for you and not others, that would, that's an illegal sign. You can, of course, sign right your car. We've spoken about this, uh, but Let's take for an example an existing um, elected member. If they want to uh, sign right their car, they can't park that in any of our council car parks around this building. Uh, they will be asked to remove them off site because, uh, again, this is the council premise and you can't electioneer on council premises. 
Uh, this one here is quite a good illustration of um, Nina Dixon, um, who is running for mayor and on the council um, itself. So it's quite clear by the two ticks there that she's running for um, a couple of different positions there. This one was a cardboard cutout. <laughs> um, a little bit different um, to encourage people to vote. Um, so long as he's following the guidelines of um, the current council's uh, policy and signs hoardings um, would be appropriate. Um, if it's not within the policy, um, then not. So really encourage you to make sure that uh, you get a copy of our signs and hoardings policy to make sure that your signs um, are the right size, the right dimensions, all of that sort of stuff. And this one here is just for a bit of a laugh. Uh, this gentleman here didn't actually run for council, um, but thought it would be a really good idea to sort of encourage people. <laughs> um, saying that, the sign itself is probably the appropriate size, and it's on a wooden hoarding. Um, he's got his name. Um, he's got that he's running for council, vote in a tick. Um, if he was legitimately running for council, the only thing he would probably get done for here is that he doesn't have an authorisation. <laughs> so the election process and the results. So uh, currently out for inspection at the moment is the preliminary electoral roll. Uh, that is available at the library and here in council offices if anybody wishes to see that. The final electoral uh, roll uh, will be updated after the 12th of August when they have completed their campaign for enrol to vote. Um, and it is that final electoral roll which is used to publish and send to you your voting papers. If you really want a copy, you can purchase a hard copy of that for $100. Or if you just want it for the ward, it's $50. Special voting. So you can uh, put in a special vote, and that is for anybody who spoils or loses or does not receive their voting papers. It's also for anybody who um, has a last minute, um, oh, I've missed getting on the roll, and you come in and do an enrolment after the 12th of August. Um, that date there would mean you're not on that published roll, but you can still vote and you would do a special voting. Special voting can occur from the 16th of September right through to election day. You can come in here and cast your special vote um, or we can post out uh, new forms for you. You can even, although we don't encourage this because we want to see your voting papers in well before Saturday the 8th of October, but for any reason, if anybody's running late and has a last minute vote that they want to get in, come in here into the customer centre um, and you'll be able to uh, return your voting papers and do a special vote. The election results, the results that everybody wants to know on the 12th, on the 8th of October come 12 noon. Voting closes at 12 noon, but by about three o'clock, uh, we hope that around 90% of the votes uh, will have been received um, and we'll be able to start counting those. And when we get those progress results in, the candidates, so all candidates, will get a phone call from uh, some of our council staff, um, letting you know that you've been successful or unsuccessful. Those uh, progress results are also published on the council website, um, and we also email where we have your email address. Uh, we will email those results to you. The preliminary results, um, so this is late on Sunday, the 9th of October, and this is generally when we have all of the ordinary votes have been processed. And a final result is expected by Thursday, the 13th of October. So this now includes all of the special votes. Coming into office, okay, so members who have been successful come into office on the day following the official declaration is made. So when we get that final result in on that Thursday, the council will publish a declaration most likely on the Friday, 
which then means you come into office um, the following working day. So that is likely to be Monday the 17th or Tuesday the 18th of October. That means you've been declared as an elected member. It doesn't mean you can act as one. And you can't um, take up your duties of an elected member until after the official swearing in. That meeting uh, generally takes place in the last week in October. And from then on, uh, there will be an official new council. That actually brings me to the end of the presentation today. Um, I'm happy to take a few questions if you've got some. Um, there are a number of resources that are available. Really encourage you to go on to our council website. Um, there's a raft of information there. Um, up there on the screen there is just a bit of a list of some of the information that is available to you. Lastly, I'm just going to do a little bit of a plug for the pre-election report, which is a, uh, a resource that the chief executive is required to publish in the lead up to the elections. The intent of that is to promote conversation uh, and hopefully uh, link voters with um, candidates. It's a completely neutral document. It is based on the issues um, that Rotorua is facing, some of the key projects that the council has underway. So it's very much about providing information to stimulate a conversation amongst our voters which may line up your own values with the values of uh, candidates that you see running. So thank you uh, for coming along today. I hope um, that has given you a uh, valuable information to either encourage you to continue and pursue uh, running and standing for council or for taking away and being able to encourage other friend and family that they may wish to stand for council. I'm happy to take um, a couple of questions if we've got them. <laughs>